Hello, Internet, cyberspace, cosmic land of all things uh, electronic and things that go down in the annals of computer clouds for time memoriam. Here is another humble offering, I think this is my vlog number nine, into my musings and ideas and concepts about playing the saxophone. And as we've said, they're only my ideas, right? There's no right or wrong way for anyone to do anything. Um, I'm sure you've got your own ideas on how to do things. And obviously, if you're finding your own path through this all, that's the name of the game, right? To come up with our own way of doing things. Uh, but if I can inspire you a little bit through helping to re-inspire myself, and what I mean by that is I've been very blessed to travel the world, playing with lots of great musicians. But for the last 10 years, I have been living in New York, working in the New York construction industry, which is a fairly soulless abyss with not much... Um, other than financial reward to write home about, but the things you do to support a family, right? But now, getting back into music, which is fantastic, and hopefully um, by making some of these videos, not only am I re-inspiring you, I'm re-inspiring myself, okay? So the lessons I wanted to talk about today were um, time, time feel, and rhythmic stuff. That's where I'm going to start, okay? I'll see where I go off because, you know, I can go off on kind of crazy tangential avenues of exploration. But um, I think thinking about rhythm and time is something that can really help identify us as a player. We already spoke, didn't we, about how sound can identify us as players. And um, we know that some players might, old school, say, you know... <laughs> vibrato kind of really dates it whereas somebody else might might play um much more bite and up front and the time feels a bit more doo -doo -doo -doo, right so time is something that helps identify us as a musician um Dave Lehman's got so much great stuff on education out there. I don't want to regurgitate his ideas for a minute. But he talks about one of the benefits of learning transcriptions is getting a, getting an idea of where players sit on the time. You know, we can play up on the beat. We can play smack bang in the middle of the beat. We can really sit back on the beat. People like Dexter and Hank Mobley, really way, way back. Whereas other players are much more up on the beat. Everyone's going to have their own natural place where they want to sit on the time. But one thing I just wanted to wax lyrical about was rhythmical intent. Okay, now what I mean by that is let's just take a tune like Ornithology. Okay, now I know it's bebop, it's dating the music, etc, etc, blah, blah, blah. But you know, it goes like ba da ba da dee da do da do da ba da ba da ba do da dee ba do da ba da ba do be ba do ba zee da do da dee ba do ba be da do be ba ba do ba ba dee ba 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 do ba. Right? Now, often when I had jazz students in the past, you'd hear them play it, and they'd play all the right notes. They'd go ba da ba da ba da ba da ba da da ba da ba da 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 but it lacked something, right? And I think what it lacked was that rhythmic drive of it. It's it, even though it's written ba da ba da ba da ba da ba da da, it's ba da ba da ba dee ba do do da ba da ba da ba do da dee ba do da ba do do da do dee ba do da. Bow, bow. It's got the pam and the pow, right? And when you listen to people like Bird playing these bop melodies, the rhythm and the drive that he would put into that is something that isn't really captured when you write that down okay um, and one thing I used to like to practice on and get students to work on was taking a melody like ornithology dropping the melody notes out of it and just taking the rhythm right and trying to just get used to singing it with some kind of energy, right? Ba da ba da ba dee ba do do da ba da ba da ba dee do dee ba do da ba dee ba do do ba do bao da ba ba da ba ba dee do ba do ba to be ba ba da ba do do ba do bao. 
right? Because if you can get used to singing that feel, it really helps, I think, with when we play it on the horn to play it with some kind of feeling and so it comes alive and it has some sort of effervescence to it if that makes sense now whether it does i don't know perhaps this is um, a load of absolute nonsense it could well be um take another one yardbird sweet i don't know why these bop tunes are coming into head like um so that first one, one, two, three, four, ba, 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 ba. So often you'd hear people play it, they go, one, two, three, four, one, ba, 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 da, 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 da. I mean, it's like put us all to sleep, why don't you, right? So again, just taking the rhythm, one, two, three, four, ba, 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 do, da, 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 ba, da, ba, da, ba, 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 da, ba, do, da, da, ba, do, da, 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 ba, do, da, 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 ba, da, ba, da, ba, 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 Getting used to feeling these rhythms, right, I think is super important as horn players. Now, I'm not necessarily saying we're always going to play in a bebop way, right, but like we said before, you can't build a house chimney down and no matter where you're at now, you can't deny that bebop happened and it's a thing of the past that everything's built upon and that rhythmical pulse, the propulsion of it, right, is something that's really useful to practice. If it's something that you find hard, I'd spend some time working on it. And I know that one of the things that I used to see in students when I taught at the university in New Zealand was even if they would have the right notes and a nice sound, sometimes it would lack that rhythmical feeling that was would drive the music forward, right? The emotional content of it. So thinking about just taking a, a, a bop head, could be anything, you know, let's take... Um, Another one, confirmation, right? Take the the melody away. What have we got? We've got da da ba di ba da da ba da di da di da ba da ba da di da ba di ba do da ba da ba da ba ba do do di da di li da do da di da ba di ba da ba ba di ba ba do di da. Okay, you see what I'm doing? Just getting used to vocalising, singing this stuff. And I realise that a lot of people can't do that. Okay, I'm not saying I'm an expert at it by any means at all. But I was told about this early on and it really helped my playing to get used to feeling this thing, especially feeling it in um, 16th kind of triplet things. So like, It's really good. Get that tongue going. And when we can vocalize it, it's much easier to play that stuff on the horn. Okay. And a lot of this, really, I think, for my money, comes back to the second line New Orleans rhythm, which is where all this stuff started, right? And it's the groove. It's the feeling of the rhythm, isn't it? You know, we get the dunk to gunk to dunk to gunk to dunk to dunk to gunk to dunk to gunk to gunk to gunk Okay, it might not be your aesthetic, you might not like that stuff, which is f absolutely fine, but for me, when I was learning and still learning, I always try to put that up the forefront of what I'm doing so that it injects that rhythmic vitality as well as the emotional vitality. A lot of these vlogs I'm doing are kind of overlapping in many ways because they kind of come from the same place. Another interesting thing that's worth talking about, if we're going to talk about bebop rhythms, is something I got from Dizzy Gillespie, right, which is a really nice way. And you've got to get your head 
kind of in a slightly different place about thinking about things like this. But let's just say you take a bar of eighth notes, right? One and, two and, three and, four and. And you take a rhythm like, let's have a look here. Let's, let's do this, here we go. Right, take a rhythm like this. Can you see I've got a dotted quarter tied to an eighth, tied over to say a half note there, right? Now, we're traditionally used to counting that like one and two and, isn't it? And that upbeat's coming on the and of two. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and, okay? That's how we think, right? One and the upbeat, two the downbeat, and is an upbeat, three is a downbeat, upbeat, downbeat, upbeat, downbeat. One thing Dizzy talked about, which I think is kind of a really nice way to think about this, is to lose the idea of upbeats and downbeats. And instead of counting one and two and three and four and, to count one, 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 one. Right? Because then, Every single beat is exactly the same. There's nothing that's an up and a down. It's all the same. And then he says, if you took this rhythm that we just took here, let me turn that into a half note, um, this one here, da, da, instead of it being one and two and, could you see we could count that? Like if, if we're giving each one, counting it in just one, 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 you could count that rhythm as one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. And now instead of it being the and of two, it's a downbeat within itself, isn't it? Can you see that? You see what I've done there? So I've written one and two and three and four, and that's how we traditionally count it. Then you just get into thinking about it one, 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 one. And then you could group a rhythm like this as one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. So instead of being the and of two, it's now the downbeat of its own thing, right? And we remember, we've got to remember that what is jazz music? Well, nowadays it can mean absolutely anything, but ultimately jazz music is the melding of European harmony with African rhythm. And it's this African rhythmic thing that is very, very important in the music. Super important. There's some great books to check out as well if you haven't got them. Uh, Mike Longo, who was Dizzy's piano player for many years, wrote several books on getting a, a used to the rhythmical feel of bebop music. And he, he's a wonderful educator and sums it up very succinctly. So worth checking those out. I'll put a link to them below. Uh, Mike Longo's his name. But that's something that's worth thinking about as well, okay, with the rhythmic side of things. Now, the other thing when we're talking about rhythm that I like to practice, and I don't do it enough, so um, I'm, I'm not professing to be an expert at any of this at all. I'm only telling you things that I like to work on, the things that inspire me and I find useful, is to practice playing unaccompanied. OK, there's a great story that my one of my big heroes and early teachers and great friends, Bobby Wellins, who's a saxophone player from England who passed away a few years ago, wonderful wonderful musician said that when he'd come to New York in the early 50s he was at a party once and Zoot Sims was there and he said Mose Allison was there and Jerry Mulligan and a whole heap of other guys and there was a jam session right he said there was a jam session up at Warren Marsh's flat um, and Zoot I don't know was getting upset about something he'd been drinking too much and he said oh I don't need a rhythm section anyway or something I don't quite understand that remember the story but then he went off into this thing and the way Bobby tells it is wonderful because if you know Bobby Wellens he was a master storyteller and he says Zoot goes into this thing and the way Zoot plays right and started playing and went off on this thing and it swung like the clappers with no no one else except Zoot Sims just playing unaccompanied and I always remember Bobby saying to me, that's something to practice. Practice playing on your own, unaccompanied. Now, some people might like to use a metronome, put a metronome on. Now, I've never used a metronome, really. Bobby always encouraged me not to use one. Other people say it's a really useful practice tool. Whatever's right for you. Again, there's no right or wrong. A lot of people say the only way is with a metronome. A lot of people say never use a metronome. Find what works best for you, okay? Because then you explore the independent investigation of the truth. But one thing I might like to do is say if we take a tune and we just set up a tempo. One, two, one. 
I mean, the name of the game is to try and keep that tempo. Two, a one, two. <laughs> Okay, and Bobby would always tell me, just practice that. Just practice doing that for like hours on end. And he said, you'd be amazed at how things open up after a while. Now we can put a metronome on the two and the four and count one, two, three, four. Or we could try and feel the bigger beat of just feeling it off the one. One, two, three, four, and one, two, three, ba do 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 ba do do ba do do ba do do ba do 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 ba do 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 ba 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 do 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 Harry Potter on the saxophone, because I think he's a wizard. Chris Potter, there's so many videos of him doing that, just playing unaccompanied at a masterclass or a clinic, taking a tune, often a very up-tempo, fast tune, and just playing on his own, and he's off, right? Again, he doesn't need the rhythm section. His time is so good, he's all over that stuff. So that's something that's really useful to practice as well, just playing unaccompanied on our own. If playing a tune with changes is, is a little bit hard to start with, like we said the other day, you can just take a blues scale and just practice playing in time. Even if you're playing the quarter notes, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. <laughs> Just trying to keep that pulse and tempo steady, I think is a really useful thing for me, right? I don't know. Whether it's useful for you, I don't know. You might think it's nonsense. But if we asked um, Henry Threadgill what he practiced and, and what his ideas are, they'd probably be very different to Art Pepper, right? And I'm sure Lee Konitz would have a very different approach to the saxophone than Arthur Blythe. And Booker Irving probably practiced differently to Johnny Griffin. There's no right or wrong for any of this stuff, right? But I think sometimes using repertoire to help give us an, an arena to practice in, if you will, is kind of sometimes super useful. So the rhythm side of things is, is really great, you know? And technique, well, that's totally subjective as well, isn't it? Um, some people are so gifted with technique. Coming back to Chris Potter, for example, I mean, he has the, a technique that us mere mortals could only dream of but we don't necessarily always need to have incredible technique to be a, a musician who can connect with others i think of people like um john lee hooker for example right i would hardly say he was somebody who could play giant steps in all 12 keys at 300 beats a minute right but yet we know john lee hooker was one of the most profound contributors to 20th century music. Um, so technique isn't always something that we should strive for in an end to itself. It's merely a means to express ourselves. But one thing that is good on the saxophone is to try and find these areas on the horn that can be challenging, that can be difficult. Learning things in 12 keys is great. Um, years ago, mid nineties, Mornington, my friend Mornington Lockett, got me to learn Donna Lee in all 12 keys. And I can tell you that was quite a challenge and um, really opened up my eyes to some things and some ideas. Um, 
Classical etudes are another great way to take an idea and practice taking it through different keys. Even if it's a, a simple something like a... Something like that, right? Might be an idea. Um, or... Ideas like that, just getting used to taking them round the 12 keys. Something like, um, what's that one? You know at the end of Giant Steps, to win a Giant Steps, funnily enough, when Coltrane plays, um, he plays a lick that I think, if I play it slowly so you can hear what it is. Something like that is good to say, right, let me take that down a semitone. Things like that are sometimes super great for helping to develop the technique and the fluency. You can break them down into little parts. Some of these exos classical exercise books, the Close book, is super cool. And as we know, there's that lovely story of Charlie Parker going to Paris to study with Marcel Mule, and Marcel Mule showing him some stuff out of the Close book, and then Bird's playing it on the gig that night, right? Which is kind of pretty profound if you think about that. It's pretty awesome. Um, so classical etude books are a great place to start with technique. And again, learning other people's transcriptions can be a really great way to get it up around the horn. You're going to find areas of the horn that are fairly difficult for you. There's a great book that I like by a classical guy called Jean-Marie Londo or Londex. I'm not sure how you'd say it. He was a, a student of Marcel Mule and was a professor at the Paris Conservatoire. And he wrote a series of books just called Mechanical Exercises for the Saxophone. And they're just hundreds of exercises, just four notes. But they're some of the most gnarly four note patterns that can really, blimey, they don't half get you thinking, you know. Um, Trying to think. I mean, I, I can't think of one off my head, but say something like it might be uh, A flat to a high F and then E so F or something F or something. That's not the best example. Um, they're, some of them are highly unmemorable, but they really get the top end and the bottom end of the horn working. So Mechanical Exercises for the Saxophone by Jean-Marie Londo is super worth checking out. But I can see I am coming to my allotted 25 minutes, which I really think is the upper limit. I was trying for five minute videos initially. I thought they would be better, but then I sort of got some positive feedback about just going for a little bit more of a vlog and a mini lesson. Um, and I don't know, hopefully this might help you. Um, if it helps you out, then that's super cool. If you think it's a load of rubbish, then that's super cool too, because it will help you find out what you do think is great, okay? Because there's no right or wrong with any of this stuff. Like we say, if we all went out for dinner, we'd probably all get something different, okay? There might be some people that would get the same stuff, but the trick is, is to align yourself with people that like the same thing. And that's when you can start putting bands together. It's when you start exploring repertoire that excites you and interests you. And obviously our tastes change. When I was younger, I found, you know, I, I didn't really listen to people like Ornette Coleman, and, you know, Albert Isler. I've, I just couldn't get into it. But now, I love that stuff. And I think one of the great truisms in music as well is, you know, today's dissonance becomes tomorrow's consonance. And the way the evolution of music changes over time. And we think up until Wagner, you know, that augmented fourth in Tristan and Isolde, that really kind of changed everything, didn't it? So, again, no right or wrong. My name's Johnny Lippiot. I'm just sharing with you some of my ideas. And this was a little lesson and a vlog into the land of rhythmical excitement in bebop lines, shall we call it that? So, without any more further ado, I will say adios. And this is Johnny Lippiot from Brooklyn, New York, signing out. And I will see you tomorrow for my last exciting instalment. And I might, because I know you want it.
do a mouthpiece comparison test. I'll get some different mouthpieces and show you they all sound the same. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow. Sayonara, bye.